And good morning, or good morrow, good day, wherever it is you are. Look, I'm just starting this video with some small tests on my behalf. One is I'm using a Bluetooth microphone recording. So I'm just using the, the free software FV Lite. For a couple of dollars, I can get the paid for version. I can increase the resolution, probably the bit depth. Uh, this video is probably not in high dynamic range. Uh, it's more of a test, but I have done test videos prior to this. I've just made sure that the sound was working. For me personally, I think it's a bit noisy. Uh, but people were complaining in the, the video I did previously that maybe I should use a, a microphone, uh, which is fair. I totally agree. Uh, it's, it's probably just as much of a test as the recording device, the, the capabilities of it, as this is a technical video to, to aid anybody. You go, well, hang on, this video is not targeted to me. You bait. The clickbait heading telling me how to fix my problem hasn't been redressed inside of a minute. That's okay, I'm doing that on purpose, right? You know, 97% of the viewers will leave in that first minute if I'm not fast paced enough. And because I want to establish a connection with uh, the people that I, I try to help, I'm quite happy to, to service further any inquiries that they have, uh, information. And uh, if I'm doing that, I, I guess it's fair to say that the, the people that I engage with. I'm quite happy to, to curate them, to select them, whittle them down a bit, if you will. And so the people with the patience to hang around for a minute to gain some information. <laughs> you guys, yeah, you people, you people are welcome. Welcome to my little barn. I say it's a barn, it's very professional. Look, as I say, I was recording this, this device, the screen I'm using, uh, the, the device I'm using has uh, one of the Samsung, I think it's a HP1 sensor. They're capable of 200 megapixels, but they use pixel binning, right? So they, they effectively generally take 16 megapixel photos and uh, they, they'll, they'll squeeze 16 megapixels essentially down, uh, 16 pixels down to one, right? That's pixel binning. And so they, they put a couple of pixels that are all side by side together and then they try to figure out the contrast and color information based on that. But they have the advantage of sort of stacking the data or taking two readouts simultaneously. So for doing high dynamic range recording, they can kind of have a, an overexposure and an underexposure simultaneous. And, uh, there might be some advantages to using said hardware. And that's the only reason I persevere without using my normal home cameras with, with proper microphones. So look, at this point, you're probably saying, well, this, this video so far has nothing to do with uh, PC tech solving. That's true, but hopefully if, if my voice is monotonous enough, you started to explore the screen to try to see what information is up there. You might have been looking at the bottom of the image, uh, I guess some, some of the information I have presenting, which includes working from the right to the left, uh, we've got the GPU fan fan speed that says how quiet, arguably, my computer is running. It doesn't actually give it in decibels, which would be the, the standard scientific nomenclature for measurement of sound, pressure level, or noise in an environment. But uh, for me, GPU fan is, it only matters from an audio point of view. GPU junction temperature is what we're going to be spending uh, the, the lion's share of investigation today looking at. Uh, that by default is not turned on in your metrics. But the, the point of this video is I'll go through, I'll show you how to turn your metrics on, I'll show you how to get these particular metrics up on the screen and uh, and, and then using benchmark software, uh, a test suite, some, some sort of a, a graphical test, uh, trying to figure out what numbers, what are the best usage numbers our video card can do. And we're, we're going to tune it. Anyway, GPU junction temperature is, is what we're going to be working with. So we need to make friends with, with that one. I'm going to say just here, right? So this is my digital finger, right? This is me in, in post-production coming in green screened with a finger highlighting a bit of the screen. Okay, maybe that's not really happening. I'm a bit more budget than that. You start off in the way you wish to continue. <laughs> you go an amateur hour here, right? If you expect nothing, then you get better than that. Well, then that's good. So working from right to left, we've done GPU junction temperature being the second point. Then we've got the, the GPU temperature. Now that can be confusing because they, they can easily be a 30 degrees plus temperature difference between those two points. The junction temperature represents the worst measured temperature point across the entire, across a lot of measurement zones. Uh, it's, it doesn't have to be consistently the same sensors that are reporting that. It's literally the worst measured point from a bunch of different sensors scattered across the card. Uh, so some, some video card manufacturers would generally opt to not give that number. Uh, it can be intimidating, can, can be scary, I guess, to see temperatures hotter than, than water turning into steam inside of our computer. Uh, it's overly, yeah, it's, it's something to, to seriously consider. 
that um, so, so normally what, what most video cards will show is the GPU temperature, right? And that there is what all the standard sensor suites will generally show you. And for a lot of people who think that their temperatures are under control, everything's fine, yet they're still experiencing shutdown issues, it will be quite easily because they're looking at that current temperature and going, oh, no, that's fine. You know, that gets up to 80 degrees, that's fine. But if that's reading 80, that could easily be reading over 110, which is when problems really start to occur. So what we need to do is, it's good to see them both up simultaneously. For me, when I'm running test suites, when I see the difference between those, is like, is often gives me a chance to figure out what parts of the GPU die are being loaded. Now, that, that's probably more of a techie thing. For the, for the point of what we're doing today, we don't actually need the GPU temperature up. We will be just looking at the junction. Anyway, working across, we've got the GPU power. Now, when you set these up, you can set up whichever ones you want on the screen. You can have RAM size. You can have uh, whatever whatever you want up on the screen. I, I personally, there's only a few that I like to, to see when I'm doing certain types of testing. So GPU power is uh, somewhat important. Uh, for me, this card has been tuned for a specific range of numbers, and uh, I like to see that in effect just here. So in, in particular, loading on the screen, uh, I've got expectations for what I think my card should be doing, and I can doubly confirm that by looking down here. Now, these are the all-important ones. GPU clock, right? That's actually how quick, how fast is my video card running right now? And that there will generate a number. And in my last video, I, at the start of the video, I tried to explain that the GPU utilization at 99% only matters depending on what this, car, what this clock number is doing. Now, for example, that can show it's 99% used, but if this here is down clocked itself to half speed, sure, I'm using 100% of my video card when it's at half speed. Now, this card here has been tuned up to about 2400 megahertz under full load, and that's what's generating at 99% thereabouts usage. Not quite, this one is down a little bit from 99, so this isn't the worst scenario. Um, but I, I found a really good loading scenario, which is this, where it's basically sitting at 100% usage, basically at full speed, basically drawing what I've triggered to be maximum power, generating the maximum temperature that I'm willing for it to go up to under this sort of load, and uh, it stayed all night long at 1500 RPM. And I know this because I, I slept with the computer in the room. Uh, it's winter here in the Southern Hemisphere. I've, I've actually moved the computer into the bedroom when doing these sorts of testings because uh, the 350 watts of power that the computer is consuming hourly, um, generating a fair bit of heat through the video card, and it does generate a lot of heat. Um, it actually warms our room. We had 17 degrees Celsius just before 6 o'clock here this morning, um, which is fantastic. It's about 4 degrees outside, so it was the low point overnight. Um, so look, we can run a little 800 watt column heater. Yeah, you know, that takes some of the bite out of the air. But uh, having a quiet computer in the corner of the room, certainly when I'm, it's, I've got practical reasons to be running it, is, um, is fantastic. It's, it's actually a better value heater than, uh, than an oil column heater, which is generally seen as the best consumer uh, value for money heaters by, uh, by heating, I guess, costs. Um, certainly better than most blow heaters. And of course, my computer has lots of fans in it, so arguably it is a blow heater. Um, but yeah, when it's when it's set down to be so quiet, you can't hear it below 1600 RPM. This particular fan has like nanite coatings on the ball bearings and the, and the fans, and the fans have little ripples in them to generate more uh, turbulence. I guess as the air passes over the surface in a way that'll pull the heat out of uh, out of the heat sense. So you know, every fan's a little bit different. Every computer's a little bit different. But uh, yeah, this computer is uh, arguably totally quiet. Uh, certainly, over ambient noise of the room generally in the ballpark of you know, low 30 decibels is, is any room. If it has, has a, just the echo of, of a noiseless environment has a background noise level about 30 something degrees. Uh, generally on your decibel meter scales, it's just kind of referred to as, as being in a quiet library. It's in that 30, 40 dB mark, you know, that whisper. Uh, if, if anything's significantly below a whisper, uh, significantly, you know, at, at the same volume level as, as your room, then that's generally considered fairly quiet. Nothing to do with the testing, I guess, today. Um, but why would I load my machine up not quite to 100% and let it run overnight? That is significant. Okay, so that's stability testing, right? So last night I sat down and, and for a few hours I churned through my numbers, churned through my numbers, churned through my numbers, came up with what I consider a, a pretty well sorted Hogwarts setting. So as we can see, it's now peaking up to the maximum of about 110. Right, it's got a bit more complex now. The sun is rising. Uh, over the hill, we've seen our loading go from about 95% to, to sitting more at the 100%. You know, what is considered 99 is 100%, right? So it's still maintaining its fast speed. The power has gone up just a little bit, and that has made that temperature go just that little bit higher. 
Now, I, I have tuned this over time so that if it does sit absolutely flat out, it will gradually climb up, climb up in time. But if I look around the screen, right, even for one split second, I look up at the sky and it's not 100% drawing, it will get control of that temperature very quickly. It'll come down, right? So, so just staring at a complex screen that's hard for the machine to draw uh, is, is not the standard usage scenario when playing, I would argue. Uh, I did choose the scene in front of me uh, on purpose because it, it does load the game in a way, which was the, the first night of testing, right? So now that I know for a fact I can run the game for you know eight, ten hours uh, without it doing anything, right? And it actually works then I now have hope that I might be able to actually do something with it and it might actually work, right? So the next night, if I was to continue on this level of testing, is I would go and find an area where the GPU is at 99% non-stop. There's a few of those in the game. Um, and then I would run it for a night and make sure that in the morning my desktop is still operational, right? So everybody has their, their different tests. I used to use uh, Dirt Rally. Heck, 15 years ago, 17 years ago, it would have been probably crisis. You know, if, if you're putting together a PC for someone and needed to check all the subsystems were working, that is your CPU, your memory, uh, you know, you put different overclocks in different bits of, of your computer, but uh, you, you then need to check it that uh, all, all the parts that you can overclock, which is things like your RAM, your GPU, and your CPU. And uh, something like crisis would be a fantastic tech demo because it would be pushing all those areas. And, you know, if, if you can run a tech demo on loop for hours and hours and hours is the worst case scenario, then hopefully your game will run stably. Now this is important because it's it's one thing to get an overclock. It's one thing to have all that extra speed. But if your machine isn't stable, right? It might be you want to set a world record, you might want to beat your friends to a particular frame rate. Okay, by all means have the fun of doing that. But if you're here watching this video, right, you're probably not at that level of confidence. You're probably just more keen to have a reliable machine. And so I'm going to give really easy numbers today. I'm going to, I'm going to talk about very easy to hit real world numbers. But things to do, I'm going to educate the consumer, right? It, teach a man to fish. So I'm going to teach you how to do this stuff for yourself. And it won't be specific to Hogwarts. As you'll see, in a, in a moment, we're going to use a, a benchmark test software. And it's got nothing to do with Hogwarts. But it allows you to get some hard and fast numbers, some fast numbers to get you in the ballpark of what you're trying to achieve. And then from there, you can refine it on a per game basis. Okay, so look, it's probably time I do that. I, I must admit, I'm standing up here beside my phone, almost like I'm doing a regular recording. I should have a bit more face in the Bluetooth tools. Uh, look, I, I can say I'm, I'm unprepared a little bit with regards to this video. I, I probably should have had my various test software up prior to recording. And uh, it, it's a little bit frustrating for myself to, to do such a large block of time of recording without having any proofing to make sure that uh, my voice has remained consistently clear and loud or that, ah, anyway, I'm, I'm not the kind of person who edits. So if I go to run through a bunch of software and it doesn't work the way I want it to, it won't be a, a short and tight video. But that's actually the greatest strength, I would say, of the video I'm trying to run here is that when, when you see a technician solve issues, right? So, so techies, sometimes when they come out to your house to service your computer, they just click a thousand things in front of you and don't explain what's going on. Now I work, I actually charge a lot less money when I go out to people's houses and I don't charge for the time. I'm, I'm just casually talking with them. But I do have a, an attitude of teach the person what they're, what they're doing on the computer and, and I, I work slower and I explain what I'm doing each step of the way. And then in part because you don't, a person doesn't need to ask those same questions again if they've learned it. And I really feel that it's, it's optimal. You know, I, I, I would rather be made redundant. If, if I, teachers, the student should surpass the teacher, right? If, if I'm educating you how to do stuff, plus all of the knowledge that you had prior to me helping you, right? You should be better off. You should be in a position to, to know more and, and have, yeah, be empowered. And so look, uh, much ado about nothing, too much talking, not, not enough testing. I'm doing this on purpose. I'm establishing a slower pace. Right? We, we need, there's a little bit of counselling here. We need to take the attitude of computer is a hobby. Okay, Modern gaming is, is not a stable platform. There's reasons for the, the PC platform to be unstable because the, 
the person who sells the PC platform has a stable platform for gaming and they know that they will get more users on that while ever the primary platform is, is a nightmare. Right? So that's just the way it is. Right? You, you can say, oh, that's just my opinion. <laughs> I've been servicing computers since the 90s. I've been using Windows since before it was an operating system. Uh, I'm not familiar with the quality of Microsoft products. And uh, yeah, it's, it is what I, you know, my opinion. It's all good. Enjoy. Yeah, I, hope, I hope you stuck through this video so far. I hope the, the, the whinginess of my voice isn't uh, such that you're going, oh, look, I, I could get all the same information from someone else who doesn't talk at this pitch or doesn't, doesn't talk so negatively about companies that I respect. Uh, well, you know, those, those companies don't respect us, so I'm probably being less respectful to them than you know, I would rather be. I'm courtesy manners and respect. I'd like to engage with everybody in the world that way. So I'm not being respectful of your time by continuing down this path. But I am leaving those numbers up and I am encouraging us that we, we need to have a a fairly relaxed attitude when it comes to doing this sort of tweaking. No, nobody gets that alive, right? You can pull your hair out or you can just take the attitude of, no, this is a hobby. This is what I've bought into. This is actually fun, right? It is fun. It's, it's learning. Or if, if you teach someone to do a skill when they're wanting to learn to do it, they're going to learn a lot more. They're going to be more active and more, more part of that, right? So here we go. Here's the tools. Yeah, I've left these up on the screen in a way that we can see them. Oh, I can make it a bit bigger. See, so, yeah, I could make this full screen. We don't need to see the background here, but uh, it's nice to see the game is still running in the background. Now, look, I'm fairly confident if we change numbers in our tuning screen of our display drivers, they don't take effect until we start the software again. So in this video, I'm going to talk about how to do things. I'm not actually going to show it in real time because just becomes a nightmare because this game takes forever to start up the pre-cache, shader pre-cache it's got going on, it's just ridiculous. Um, but okay, so this here is the display drivers config page. Now I'm just going to come back to the Windows desktop, something I don't think, I'm using a Bluetooth keyboard that doesn't have the shortcut buttons that most machines have. Right, so if you're on the Windows desktop and you're moving your mouse around, if you go to any available spot and hit the right mouse button, you bring up a menu and the top option should be AMD Software Adrenaline Edition, right? If you don't have that there, that just means you haven't installed the manufacturer's display drivers, okay? Now you still have display drivers in place. Your video card can't be used without drivers. But it's most likely, and if you're at the level where you're accepting assistance from a YouTube clip, you might not be the most technically savvy person. You might let Windows find your drivers for you. If that's the case, Microsoft has installed their own set of AMD display drivers. Now, they're not the full fat package. They don't have things like Adrenaline, which is this okay, it's software. It's called Adrenaline. And this will allow you to tweak and tune. So the first thing you need to do is to go to amd.com forward slash drivers. At least it used to be. Now, I think they're, they're trying to hijack people to come visit their web page. And they want to teach you and educate you about the fact that they're doing artificial intelligence on their dyes and stuff now. They're using it as free advertising. They never have in the past, but I guess they're finally going to get competitive. <laughs> they're operating at like one-tenth the operational fiscal budget of their competitors. They're the little guy in the war, in the video card war. And for anyone who cares about value for money, they're the only guys providing it. So yeah, a lot, a lot of people jump ship eventually after dealing with one company that's just too too greedy for, you know, too unethical at cons a consumer ethics level. But they'll, they'll always just put out the car 10% quicker. They don't care how much money they lose. They'll always make sure they've got the reigning crown of raw speed. And if they've got a, you know, they're, when they're ahead in the game, their, their cards will sit less power and do it. When they're losing the game, their cards will use more power and, and they'll win. Right? And because they're in alignment with, with the entire media and everybody buys their parts and speaks about them positively, nobody cares about the fact that the, the, the goalposts keep moving in terms of what, what a high performance card requires. Right? And so performance per watt, when they were winning the war, performance per watt mattered when they were losing the war. Oh no, nobody cares about performance per watt, right? So, so well, just pay attention to what actually matters in the video card. But I assure you, the difference of 10% speed between the fastest from one company and the fastest from another company, right? you don't factor that 10%. You get about 10, 20% extra speed annually if you upgrade to the newest cards. So 10% is just that borderline amount where you can just about notice it. And 
if you're going to pay 30% more money to get 10% more speed, you're better off just buying a cheaper video card and then you've got more money in your pocket for a mid-gen upgrade, right? Instead of upgrading your card every two and a half years or three years or five years, you can upgrade your card a year and a half or two years down the track and you'll actually have a quicker card if you stick to that cycle, it'll cost you less. Um, so there's reasons, there's pros and I'm not going to sell anyone on AMD right now. You're probably sitting here seething, going, oh, AMD, AMD. I feel the same way. This card that I'm using right now is actually recalled. But that is to say, I, I couldn't run benchmark testing software that I wanted to run. It kept just crashing the desktop and dying. The same clickbait heading I will probably generate for this video. It isn't a clickbait heading, it's a genuine heading. If you have been having games, just, just stop. If, if you're activating uh, anti-lag and your game just crashes out, right? Uh, this video is relevant to you because it will, it will show you some ways that, that these are all things that were happening to me. Uh, they wanted to, me to send the card back and uh, it, it would have been five weeks of downtime, arguably. I uh, bought this card, pre-loved, uh, got it for a fairly low price, but the, the company themselves had taken the attitude, oh, no, we'll upgrade you to the newest gen. I don't want the newest gen. I'm happy with this card. Uh, I, I don't want to pay extra money either. I'm happy with this card. So I'd rather persevere. I took the option of not posting it back to them. I've still got a fair bit of warranty period left. I thought I'd take it matters into my own hands and found that every single game works perfectly. If I just take my factory overclock card and just knock it down a little bit of speed, you know, everything just works perfectly. And so it's only a handful of titles that, that make it get a bit toasty, a bit too quick. And that might be the same for your card too. And as I said, I was using some benchmark testing software and it, it was just ticking over, right? It was just crashing and I uh, couldn't even run it. And for me, that, that's drawing the line of like, well, if, if I can't run actual software that's sold on the PC platform, then like, that's, that card's not, not fit for sale. And that's not entirely true. A lot of the benchmark soft, software will push your hardware beyond the limits. If that's the case, we expect there to be issues when running that software. Right? So I don't think it's fair to expect some of the benchmark software to run flat out and for cards to work flawlessly in, in certain situations. Well, I'd like to believe it is. It's easy to design software to, to trip up or to make a card perform poorly in any given metric. If, if you write software specifically to, to overloading a certain part of the die, it'll get too hot versus the rest of the die. Um, you, you, can, you can do anything in the world. But yeah, when, when you're running games, right? I'd like to think games are built fit for sale, fit for retail sales, <laughs> you can't be able to crank them out. And, and I just noticed that with default settings, I couldn't run Fortnite. Um, I couldn't run uh, The Witcher when, when the ray tracing mode of it came out. I couldn't run that. Um, Portal RTX couldn't run. Quake RTX, I think, did run out of the box. But uh, certainly a lot of the RTX titles uh, just were, were clicking over. If I ran Kingdom Come Deliverance but found a way to absolutely load the video card to 100% loading, I could get it to basically the junction would go over 110 and then once it had sustained 110 for a while the temperature was still climbing it would crash so what i think it is is that the junction temp can actually go to 115 and because of how hot that area of the die can get it doesn't necessarily show the moments when it peaks up to 115. i've set the interval of reporting here to be about every 0.5 of a second and by default the overlay will want to run at about, oh, what is it, every two seconds, I think it is. So in, if it's only reporting an update to the screen once every two seconds, you might miss the moment where the temperature shoots up to 130 and then shoots back down, that uh, shoots up to 110 and then shoots back down to 104. And so by dropping that interval down and having it update on the screen a little bit more frequently, I can actually see a bit closer to what's actually going on. Um, but I, I can, you can get a 30 degree jump just running any software that's fully loading the card um, in, in that junction. And if you're already sitting at 70 degree plus here, that might just take you up over that limit where the card goes to shut down. So that's what we'll be looking at today. As I said, right click on your desktop, go and run your display drivers. Now, if it's not there, if you have a little red icon at the top of that screen, uh, you haven't got AMD drivers installed, go get the latest AMD drivers from AMD. You won't have to do a display driver uninstall technically if you've got the Windows drivers in place. They will be significantly out of date and the AMD drivers should have ways of coping with them. Um, but sometimes you, you deal with the fact that Windows wants to replace manufacturer's drivers with its own and they are inferior drivers. You don't wish to be running the Windows drivers. You do want to be running the full fat package AMD drivers. 
Um, so if so, right click, select AMD, and they'll be up. Any tools that you're using, you don't have to have your taskbar on the right side of the screen. I'm hoping mine is viewable. No, I can't see it on the side of the screen. Ah, look, I haven't. My window's not big enough, damn it. But I was just going to say, if you've got, on your task manager, on the taskbar, if you've got a program there that you want to permanently have there, if you move your mouse over it and then right click over it, you'll see a little menu pop up and one of the options will be pin, pin to taskbar. And that way, even when you close that software down, you'll have a button there basically to start it up again. You might wish to do that with the AMD driver page. You can actually also set under home, oh, I think there's a tuning page somewhere, like a setup. I thought it was off here. Oh yeah, sorry, my apologies. Under config, you can come under hotkeys. And in hotkeys, you can set up whatever buttons you want. So I set, for example, bringing up um, the overlay, I believe I've got this control question mark. If I want to record right next to that, I've got control and, and the full stop or period. Uh, but you could also set up a dedicated button for bringing up the overlay. You know, you've got your options for turning on chill or anti-lag in particular, which might be useful, which we'll be talking about today. Um, turning that on and off. So look, learning your shortcut keys is, is handy, but there's so many to learn on a computer. Don't be afraid to come in under your options, which is the cog, under your hotkeys, and you set up a, a, a shortcut key that will work for you for, oh, I'm just trying to find, where is it, question mark, uh, trying to find it on this page. Anyway, get confident with your page here. I'm too far back from the screen, I'm able to zoom on and do this sort of stuff. Anyway, once you've got the AMD drivers on, everyone else like spinning on. So yeah, spin onto this bit in the video. It's probably 20 minutes in by now. Thank you, thank you for your patience being here with me. You can get to your performance. You can come over to tuning. But for now, we're just going to come to metrics, right? I'm just going to help the newbies, the people who've never done this before, figure out how to get the relevant pages up on the overlay, right? So while I make this video, I'm just going to make the size a lot bigger. Look at that. How much easier is it there to see? Yeehaw. Um, also, transparency at thereabouts 80% makes it quite invisible to the screen. But if you just lower that, you put a little solid black bar up behind it, you can see these numbers clearly wherever you look. Um, there, there is an advantage to that. When I run some games with frame rate lock off or vSync off, if it's running in a window and Microsoft, if, if the operating system allows there to be screen pairing in place, by running this overlay, it actually forces it to be composited by the desktop compiler in a way that works with your frame sync. It, basically, it locks it back to being in sync and you don't get the frame tearing. And by doing that, right, by just running this overlay, even if you set the transparency at 100%, right, you can't actually see it, it'll just take the screen tearing off your screen. So, you, so I encourage you to run the overlay, even if you're not trying to get any information off it. Um, you, you might just want to turn all the tracking down to nothing, or run it at a small size, make it basically completely transparent so you can't even see it. But then if you turn that overlay on, you can get rid of screen tearing. Yeah, that's just one of the tricks I would give. So look, what have I got under frame rate? You can have uh, usually frame time, I think it should be under that one, but GPU, what have we got? So we can go utilization, which I think is handy, clock speed, I think those two need to be hand in hand, otherwise you don't get the full information. Um, power consumption, I like to see, because then I can actually see what I'm doing. We need to see potentially temperature, but we can get rid of that one. But we do need junction temperature. Okay. Now, fan speed for me, eh, I pay attention to that. I don't, nobody else needs to. GPU memory, you don't need to. But look, if you turn it on, boom, see, it turns up on the screen. You can get rid of it. Um, you know, memory clock speed, well, that number doesn't vary ever once your game started, so who cares? Uh, and CPU, if you really want to see CPU utilization, you could possibly do that. Uh, but I, I don't think that's very practical in the modern world to do so because it doesn't show you if one core is loaded. Right? So if I come over here to my task manager, come over to performance, well, you can tell when a person's had a complete shutdown, they lose the, oh no, here we go. Um, right, so by default, 
I don't think the screen shows your independent cores. I think you have to go right click and you can change graph two and then logical processes and then it should come up and show you what each core is doing. This is a six core CPU, but because it's got hyper threading, it shows 12 uh, threads essentially in, is able to be used. Uh, this, this can be interesting. It gets familiar with your task manager. It's uh, control alt delete. We'll bring up a basically a logout screen on your PC. From there, you can click on task manager. Again, that little trick I was giving you before about once something is on your task bar, if you move over it and right click and go pin, you can leave yourself a permanent button to get back to that. So I do that for the old control panel. Uh, if you go win key run or go to your task menu and type in the word control, that's able to find your old control panel. I right click and pin that to my taskbar. It's probably one of the most useful things I find on my taskbar. Uh, but you know, whether you're a media player or a different web browser deserves a place permanently pinned, right click over the, the task bar on the item, right click, pin, pin there. Right. Yeah, I know this video is too slow for some people. I won't continue the slow pace. At some point, I'll just default to regular techie speed. I'll probably speed up a little bit in what I'm saying. And uh, apologies there to the, the slow people that are coming along going, oh, this guy is talking too slow, but I don't have to keep rewinding it. You just keep saying the same thing at least three times. It's great. You know, oh, look, I guess I'll find my crowd out there. <laughs> people who can handle an Australian accent, maybe. People who can handle a fast paced talker, perhaps. Anyway. It's not practical to just read your utilization. Right? My, my CPU is at 33%, or whatever, that's fine. But one core could be fully used. Well, three, three cores could be fully used, and then no other cores could be used. It would still be 30%. But the problem is, whenever one core is fully maxed out, you might be bottlenecking your software. Right? The software it might be waiting for a particular bit of math to be done before it then hands that information over to the next part of the chain. And if it's got to wait too long because the, the CPU speed isn't fast enough to do that bit of math in a single pass, right, then the CPU might be bottlenecking you. But we generally don't expect that the CPU is bottlenecking our video card if we don't see any core running at 100%. But that's where I just say it's, it's a bit misleading to see utilization here. If, if you take the attitude of, oh, my CPU is never at 100%, my CPU is not holding me back, it's not necessarily true. It can be handy to come to a CPU monitor of some sort, come in and have a look. It doesn't have to be this monitor, right? Hardware Monitor Pro, good little bit of software here. You can leave it running. This is the best thing. It doesn't cost anything for a trial version. Trial version after a month won't work if you're on the internet, so I've turned my internet off. Uh, my trial version here, which I've had for many, many years, still works. Okay, it's good enough to block off some of the reads. Each time you start, it'll just randomly block off some of the sensors with the word trial. Sometimes you might need to close it down and restart it one or two times. Of course, if you're a professional or if you're using the software on a regular basis, I highly encourage you to buy it. Uh, it supports external displays. I think the old G15 Logitech keyboards had a little display on them. You could build up, using the software and the tools, a, a Logitech display. <laughs> you could actually have all your monitoring tools on an external screen. Of course, you could do the same thing uh, with things like AMD Link, uh, which, oh no, that'll probably be on the recording stream would be it's an AMD link. I'm not using it actually at the moment, my bad. Um, but there's software inside of your AMD driver tools, which allows you to use an old Android phone or an old tablet as a remote screen to put all of this information up on, right? I do encourage, look, that's, that's where computers get fun, right? You, you bought a computer over a gaming console, right? You bought yourself a hobby, Please enjoy it. Right? Learn, learn the ways to do some of the things that your computer can do. Learn your display drivers. Right? Your display drivers have so much power, so much capability. Um, they can be a lot of fun in terms of what you can do with them. So look, we can set up our tracking. We can set our tracking up to cover stuff that actually matters to us. Um, and then we need, to, we need to be able to monitor. Right? So for me, for example, every computer has different monitoring tools. I'm fortunate enough to have uh, a good power supply that actually has sensors that shows me how much power I'm taking from the wall and then how much output that is, right? So I'm consuming about 450 watts, which is what I've tuned for. I don't want to go above that. For regular gaming, I shouldn't need to. You know, by default, my video card can happily take 320 to 350 watts. Uh, not quite by default, 320 watts by default, 280 out of the shop is what they're kind of expecting to do in all games at all times if need be. Uh, so when I tune my video card down to only sipping around 200 watts, it brings my total power consumption down. But I mean, I've got about six drives and four chips of RAM, and each one of them uses five to seven watts. And, and bit by bit, because I've got 
you know, I used to have two optical drives in the machine and all that stuff adds up. I've got a ton of fans. And so my power consumption can be a lot higher than the standard. Um, but you'll, you also see that vary depending on scenes. Generally, I'm gaining around 320 watts, um, but it, it has the headroom to jump up in a tricky scene to consume a lot more power as need be. Now, your power consumption from the wall and as used by your power supply, right? most machines won't have those settings. You don't need them. But again, if you're the professional tester, if you're somebody who wants to know what your rig is doing, if, if you've got sensors that give you information that's practical or will help you in your investigation, I'd say get something like Hardware Monitor Pro or get some, some tools that might help you. Now, Hardware Monitor Pro might not be it for you, and I, I just want to let you know that you can have errors when you're running any external tools, they can have conflicts. So the reason why, and I don't think these are the best tools on the market, certainly for measuring frame time or for, for getting nice uh, information that people can use, but right, there are better tools. Some people use, do their overclocking through Afterburner. Uh, there's a lot of different ways you can do your overclocking, right? But I use the default tools in part because I have less issues. For example, if I go to overclock my CPU, I can do so here. I can load a profile, put in whatever numbers I want. This software isn't always happy to run when this software is running. And same again, when I read software notes for AMD issues, they can have further issues. In fact, being part of the Vanguard testing program, when you fill out your profile there to say, well, here's how I use my machine, and they want to know, are you doing recording and streaming? Are you running other testing tools? Because when you have instability and you're running other testing tools, right, your instability might not be related to the hardware itself. It could be the fact that you've got several, uh, I guess, requests on a particular sensor which might conflict with each other, and then the machine gets tripped up. And then the values report incorrectly, and then because the values are reporting incorrectly, the, the cooling solution doesn't work correctly, or it doesn't it doesn't run the way it should be running. So look, just to circumvent potential problems here, sometimes when people are trying to troubleshoot your non-working system, they say you've got to install Display Driver Uninstaller. Okay, it may be true if you just swap from one brand video card to another and you haven't reinstalled Windows. You know there is practicalities of going to safe mode, completely removing one set of video drivers, having your new video drivers already downloaded and then just being able to boot back into Windows without the internet being on and installing a clean set of video drivers. Right, that is an optimal scenario. A lot of people run display driver uninstaller and don't do the safe mode, proper uninstall mode. That'll get you out of trouble. You know, 99% of the time, just as good as a, as a regular display driver uninstaller driver sweep. But sometimes the difference will be, oh, did you do it in safe mode? Because there's a couple of, access, a couple of the files in, in your display drivers that are being accessed by the operating system and it won't release those if it's not in safe mode. It'll, it'll be clamping other than so, like with two hands, right? Like like candy and just wants to hold on to it and you can't, and it's a screaming kid, right? You try to take that out of its fingers, but those fingers are not going to release, right? It just goes, I want those display drivers, they're mine. So if you go over to safe mode and say, I, I want to get rid of those display drivers, right? The, the fingers aren't all curled around the display drivers, they're not gripping onto them with a desk grip. So, Safe mode display driver uninstaller is the ultimate mode. It is the proper mode. It's usually the first thing people will try to correct you when, they, when, you, when you're trying to tell, I've done eight hours of troubleshooting. They're going to want to take you back to basics. They're going to try to make sure you've done what we say is the DDU or display driver uninstaller process. Right? But again, you might not need to do that. If you haven't just come from a competitive brand's video card or if, you, if it's a clean operating system build or you've, you've just... Yeah, maybe if you've been running a different video card, it's practical. But if you haven't, right, you kind of can bypass those steps, right? If you haven't been running beta display drivers just because you think they're going to help you, beta just means cutting edge display drivers that might not have proven themselves or tested themselves in the public space, right? You might need to run DDU. But it's usually for advanced users. The people who need to use it generally know about it. They can do it, right? We don't necessarily need to do that. And, Really, I, I, hopefully I'm just working here with people that just didn't even know that they didn't have AMD display drivers on. They were still using Windows drivers, right? I would have been caught out. If I was just using Windows drivers, I would be using default clocks on my card. Default clocks on my card crash when running certain applets or certain, certain tests and some games, if I've been running them for long enough, my junction temperature goes above 110. The game will shut down at desktop or the machine will shut down and turn off, right? So... 
Yeah, it's practical. Have, have, have some control, get your display drivers under control, install AMD drivers if you have to go to amd.com slash forward slash drivers, uh, or just go to their webpage now. And I think if you go support and then probably downloads and drivers, and then just, just as long as you, you get any product in there uh, and choose the right operating system, either Windows 11 or Windows 10, any set of drivers will work, right? They, they don't build different drivers for different cards. Those drivers will recognize your card, they'll, they'll install the relevant references to your card and tune themselves accordingly, you'll be right. Alrighty, so once you've got your drivers in place, you've got the option of right clicking on the desktop and choosing that AMD top option. This will bring up your adrenaline page. It'll probably be in a small window. You can either double click on the top bar or hit the maximize button. It'll go full screen, at which point you can click on performance you can come down to tuning. Now the first thing you're going to see here is you've got global tuning, which is what's running basically at the Windows desktop level or what's going to take effect in any software you run, unless you run a profile. So if you're running a profile, you can set up on a per game basis for different profiles to load in. Right? And you can say, I don't have a lot of games set up here by profile. I don't. I actually run my global tuning settings across the machine and they, they generally work fine. But uh, I, I was using The Witcher as a tuner piece of software because it was... the, the it was the one that was getting hottest quickest and crashing quickest. And unlike Hogwarts, which has that pre-shader caching step, which takes a couple of minutes to, buy, to get through every single time you start the software, uh, I didn't like that added latency in the test, so I was just running The Witcher. Once I found test settings that worked in The Witcher, I then played around with them in other bits of software. And then actually being quite happy with the Hogwarts settings, I probably have them running now at the global level. But uh, you can come in on a per title basis and set these things. Now remember, whatever settings you set in here, don't take effect until you've basically, you save them or you've got to hit apply once they're done, and then you've got to start the software up, right? And then, then it will load whatever settings you've got set to either that software or your global settings if not set to any software. And you've got a few steps here that you can use. One of the methods I've read for tuning your card is that by the, by, when you first come into the tuning page, it'll be on default. You've got these first three options. You won't see this over here yet. You've got under vault, overclock, and then this one here should be do it my way. Oh no, that's very random. So you've got these steps and then you've got custom. Sorry. Yep. So you've got um, under vault, which is try to use less voltage into the card and keep the speed up as quick as possible. You've got overclock, which is working on the attitude I'm going to give more voltage, I'm going to push for faster speeds. And then you've got overclock the, the VRAM, right? That keeps it separate to, to the other step. Um, and it's fair to say you probably don't need to touch a VRAM at all. Uh, I think for the 6 Series cards, it's not really a lot of games that benefit from the, the extra VRAM headroom. If you've got a, a RAM bottleneck or a bandwidth bottleneck, you might gain more speed by cranking up the VRAM. Uh, and, and take whatever VRAM boost you can get for free without, without it needing more power. But what I find is that um, I, I don't want to take my VRAM as fast as possible if it's not giving me any extra frame rate. I'm getting ahead of myself here. If I'm sounding technical for a second, what I'm just trying to say is basically ignore this one. Um, but then you get over to custom. Now, I should begin by saying, as an overview, that the best way to overclock AMD video chips for the last many, many years, basically going back to Vega, uh, I don't think the Furies, I think the Furies benefited from the traditional overclocking method, but, but the, the way to overclock AMD video chips now, going back quite a large amount of time, is just good overclocking practice, actually. It's to get the thermals right down. Right? So when, when your card is operating at a low point when it's thermal headroom, the power that goes into it is more effective. I guess the way to say what I'm saying, it's easy to say it in the inverse. Right? So what happens? The hotter your card gets, the less effective the power that's going into the, the die in the middle of the card, the chip in the middle of your graphics card, the hotter it gets, the less effective the power that's going into it becomes. So the opposite to that is the cooler it runs, the power that's going into it is fully utilised. It's utilised more effectively. So the best way to overclock these cards seems counter, counterproductive but it's to undervolt, it's to give them less power. And then when you give them less power, they run cooler. Because they're running cooler, the, the power can be more effective. So you can then actually ramp the speed up until your temperature starts to go up again. And you'll eventually find that thermal point where above this temperature, 
I've got to give it a lot more power and I've got to give it a lot more clock and I've not really noticed any improvement. Right? And that's, that's the wall. And you can, you can work really hard to push past that wall. You can get water cool in your video cards. You can do whatever. Or you can just acknowledge that that wall is the point of no return, that the efficiency or the effectiveness of what you're trying to do is just getting into silly land. And so we don't do that. We just go undervolt. And all undervolting does is instead of running at 1,200, it'll run at 11. By default, the undervolt runs to 11.75. Okay, now I don't have a lot of interest in undervolting because I have found across video cards, the number it seems to generate seems to be very much the same. Uh, and it, <coughs> it doesn't seem to be, apologies for the cost there, it, doesn't seem, it seems to be a bit conservative. You, you can drop it a bit lower um, and still have it work 100%. So it's good though to learn that number. And so what I've seen a few other people's guides are, you run the undervolt, you write that number down, it might say 11.75, it might say a number a bit lower than that. And then you go over to overclock your VRAM and you find out what the numbers are there and then you, you overclock and you find out what, whatever the fastest number is and then they say, and then you go over to custom and you basically slot those numbers in, right? And it's true, that's the video card's way of finding these, these are my best numbers I can achieve. Now there is, a, there, there is reasons why that method isn't flawless, but it's clever. And look in fairness, those numbers pretty much do a line up with generally what you'll find are some of your best tweak numbers you're going to get. So probably not bad to have reference to, probably not bad to know what, 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 what does my card think are the best sorts of numbers that it can get. But anyway, we've been running for a while now and I haven't given any Easter eggs, I haven't given any solutions. So let's start with the first solution, what worked for me, right? So remember my card manufacturer wanted me to post my card back I could not run games. Games were dropping back to desktop. Uh, I couldn't turn on features like anti lag or the game would just shut. If I ran certain games, I'd either drop to desktop or they'd crash or the computer would completely shut down. And the solution to all of those problems was just getting my junction temperature under control. It was a problem I didn't even know I had until I went into performance metrics, turned on my GPU monitoring so I could see the junction temperature until I had that up on screen, I didn't even know that my junction was getting so hot. But once I could correlate, wow, my testing software just crashes when I run that particular test. And then when I started to see, well, what was going on at the moment of the machine shutting down? The thing that consistently was happening was it was my junction temperature. It was getting too hot. So once I tried to get that under control, my problems went away. I could actually run the testing software I previously couldn't run. I could run my games and not just for 10 minutes or an hour, but flawlessly all night. And so I agree, it might not be the ultimate solution. It might be you wish to send your video card back and have that cooling reapplied because thermally it might not be hitting its best on the junction anymore. Or we can acknowledge that when your card came out, it was totally fine to operate with the software on the market. And it's only because software has come out that's loading particular parts of your video die in unbalanced ways so that some of the dye is getting really hot while the rest of the dye is basically having a holiday. And the dye is misreporting itself as, oh, I can handle the load I've got right now. And it really can't because half of it is overloaded and then it's crashing. And so all we're gonna do is just tune it down a little bit and you'll actually find much faster frame rates. All right, so I'm just gonna pause here for a second. I'm not the bearer of bad news. Hear me out and work to my total solution and it won't be as disappointing as the individual parts of the tuning sound. Okay, now I'll give you a parallel. I used to do tech support for an internet service provider. And if people were using software modems or not very good modems that weren't, or, or had really dodgy phone lines into their house and their phone lines couldn't really sustain their internet speed. Now the thing is, is those, phone, those modems could dial up at the highest possible speed they could do. And trying to work as quick as they could if they couldn't achieve that, they would just like what we're having, they would have a crash out, they would disconnect. And then the, the user would be stuck having to reconnect, right? 30 seconds of downtime, their, their phone squawked at the, the, the modems on our end until they, they squawked in a particular pattern that they realized, oh, we both know that speed, we both know that language, oh, we'll, we'll now connect. 
And so they would train themselves at the start of a connection and they'd go, what speed can I connect at? And if they found a squawk pattern that was faster than they technically could sustain, they'd go, let's connect at the speed. And then over time when they were connected, if they couldn't connect at that speed, they'd have to retrain themselves. So instead of loading your web page when you request it, they go, oh, hang on, I can't talk at that speed. And they might waste 10 seconds or 15 seconds retraining themselves on the line, going, what speed is the fastest we can talk at? Well, for that 10 seconds, you're not moving any data, you're not doing anything. And it's actually slower than if you had the speed set at a slightly slower speed in the first place that it can sustain at 100% and never have to question, what speed am I doing? What speed can I do? Oh, I better adjust that, right? Locking a speed that it can do and succeeding at that actually works out quicker. And I'll give you the example, working with that, that example I just gave of a modem. If I, if I was working for your internet service provider and you gave me a technical support call, part of helping you, a solution that I could put in place, and it worked for a lot of customers, I didn't use it very often though, tried not to, it was my last resort, because no customer wants to be told, we're gonna make the machine work quicker by locking it down at a slower speed. But uh, and the example is, if, if you're driving in the city at 80 kilometers an hour, or your motor's fast to speed, and you keep coming up against traffic lights, the time it takes you to drive the city might be 10 minutes. But if we set your maximum speed to 60 instead of 80, like you thought you could do, but you don't have any traffic lights, you might get to the city in seven and a half or nine minutes or some smaller amount of time. You'll get there quicker. Now, that's, that's what happened. Now, I'm, I'm jumping ahead of myself here, but I'll let you know I spent all of last night for about four hours before I went to bed just tweaking, just testing, just testing, just testing, finding numbers that worked. Right, the last video I did, I didn't have optimal numbers in place. Now I've come up with some optimal numbers, I feel, for this game. Uh, I would say I've got three different profiles I would happily use. One where my junction temperature never kisses 110. One where my junction temperature will get to 110. And then this one where my junction temperature will get to 110 if I load the video card at 99% for a very, for a sustained amount of time, uh, which I find is perfect. It means I can brute force through a cut scene, I can brute force through it out. So the numbers I'm currently using for me were the, the tweaked values. But it took me a while to find those. It took a lot of benchmark testing to get there. And uh, my apologies, I lost my train of thought there as to why uh, I'm getting ahead of myself and, and saying uh, that these are more the tweaked values. Uh, but look, at, in the process of testing, you need to start off with some numbers that work. You need your game to be stable, right? As, as far as I'm concerned, if your platform is not stable, right, if you can't rely on it as a tool, that's no fun. If you're just trying to beat your friends to a slightly higher frame rate and you don't mind instability in your software, or if you're a professional and you don't mind instability because when there's a problem, you know how to sort it out at two o'clock in the morning when you can't ring your friends to get answers, by all means, you experiment. Go, go, off, off, go off the beaten track, right? Do stuff that's non-standard. And, and when you find yourself down a dirt road, at the end of that road, not knowing where to go, not knowing how to progress, you're a trailblazer, you'll figure it out. Right? But if you're not a trailblazer, you just need to know how this stuff works, you just want to be confident in what you're doing. If you run those three steps, they will generate numbers for you. If you write them down on a piece of paper and then slot them in, when you go custom, you've got that choice. Now, when you go custom, what you'll find is that each one of these little sections is actually locked out, all right? If you want to do GPU tuning, you'll have to tick this little box here to open that up. If you want to do VRAM tuning, you'll have to tick this little box here to open that up. So when you first open this screen up under custom, it's actually going to look really basic, all right? It doesn't have much going on. But in order to tweak each of the respective parts, be it your fan, be it your video RAM, and be it the core die of your, your graphics processing unit, your GPU, you need to go to those three sections. And then you've actually got a power tuning section, which is for serious overclocking. You might want to control how much voltage that your video card can really eat into when it's under load. All right, but if you go custom, we want to come in here, we want to go into advanced control, and then we want to be able to slide these dials. Now, I've seen some people out there come up with some clever ideas with upping your minimum frequency and upping your maximum frequency and setting them within 100 megahertz of each other and forcing your card to, to not swing a lot when it's trying to get control of itself. When it goes, oh, I can't run at this speed anymore, I'm getting too hot. It only drops back to a slightly slower speed. Look, that's clever, thinking outside of the box. 
Uh, I can understand how that might work for people. That's good. But uh, come down to voltage. This is one of the ones that's important to us. When we're trying to get control of that junction temperature, that voltage adjustment is going to be such a significant part of what's generating the heat, as will be the speed it runs at. So these two numbers here will matter. Now, when I was trying to get control of the Witcher, or just making my machine work, I started by dropping that down to 1850. I think I dropped it to 1950, and then when it was running, it doesn't quite hit that speed. It gets as close to it as it reasonably can with the power envelope it's got to work with. So I think I probably dialed in about 1950 when I was running the game. It was running at um, 1850. It just worked. It was working flawlessly. I was really happy. And then I could crank that speed up. And the idea is you crank it up bit by bit until you, until you find what works. Now, if you're using monitoring software, you can jump out. You can actually, each time you make a change, you can see, well, how much of a thermal difference does it make when I'm running a benchmark? Or how much of a thermal difference does it make when I'm playing the game? The other option you've got is you can use these tools up on the screen and you can generally see it in real time, what's going on. Anyway, you might wish to try some numbers here. Just while I'm talking through this section, I'm just going to say last night I found with the voltage, when I, when I first ran the voltage low, it ran at 1149 at its lowest. I think other people have had success at 1147, 1148. Um, seems to be consistently a good low voltage. And that's not all the voltage you're giving. Most people then come under power tuning and crank that up to like plus 15 or plus 10%. Um, for the last week or so, I've been running at minus the bottom minus, minus 10 or minus 15, whatever it was set to. Uh, just trying to get absolute control over that voltage and just choke it, choke it at power to keep that temperature low. And that was fine. It worked, and I got flawless frame rates. All my games were smooth. I had no crashing. That's great. But I'm now willing to wait out the slightly deeper waters, and therefore I'm willing to share a video with slightly better numbers on the screen for you. And apologies for taking this much of the time. It's a chance to meet me. Ha <laughs> ha! Right. You, won't, you won't find the permanent unsubscribe button. You won't find a button saying never, ever show me another video by that person ever again. Ah, oh, dear. Okay, you're not my demographic. And I must admit, I'm not, I'm not proud of this video. I'm not really a coffee drinker. I've had a couple of coffees this morning. I was up too late running these benchmark testings. I didn't really feel motivated to do the video today. It is earnest to get it done. I'm just doing it. So I do think a better video than this one when I've, when I've actually paid $3 for the recording software on my phone can record at higher resolution, etc. You know, that, that'll happen. Uh, for now, this is just getting it done. So if you just want to run with my settings, at 11.49, that didn't quite work. I was occasionally getting software dropping back to Windows. So if I was running my benchmark software and it just closed for no reason whatsoever, I probably wasn't giving it enough voltage. And so you just incrementally increase that until it can run stably. Uh, one you might notice with VRAM tuning, when you get to the bleeding edge, of any of your limits, right? So VRAM's a good one. When, when you push it to the absolute max, if, if you're just not quite giving enough power, you'll actually see errors in the render to screen, right? And this is where it's important. Anytime you make adjustments, you better go test it, right? It's one thing for it to say it's running at 2,500 megahertz, but if it's not running any quicker, or if usually when you're running it, there's artifacts or there's issues on the, on the render to screen, yeah, it's no good to you. And then you're just gonna give it a bit more power to stabilize and make sure that your card can run that. And uh, that was how we used to benchmark check. The same like crisis, just running on loop. Your VRAM was right at the limit when you started to see extra green pixels that shouldn't have been there just rendering on the screen. It's like knock your VRAM down 10 megahertz at that point or just uh, give it a little bit more voltage to, to actually able to run effectively and, and do what it's meant to do with that error. Um, but most, most of the video cards I think default to 2000 or whatever your default speed is there because it's not going to net any extra frame rate. And if you're under benchmark testing or if in your game it doesn't net more frame rate, play around with VRAM. But I just suggest for the time being, just you leave that one down at its lowest or, or just be very gentle in how much you bump that up if you're noticing it's generating extra temperature or consuming extra power. Um, but from my testing last night, it, whilst I could get it to use more power under VRAM checking, and I could get it, I could shoot that up by another 30 watts or more, not just on VRAM, but I could have it running a lot, a lot more power into the die. It wasn't actually adding any extra temperature at the junction, right? So the areas of the die that your VRAM is sitting at and running it a little bit faster wasn't putting permanent heat, it wasn't putting heat into it in a way which is probably going to affect uh, the actual numbers that, that mattered to us. So you can tune that independently, arguably, of this. Um, but yeah, unless your game benefits from it, which 
arguably with when it comes to path sourcing or ray, ray tracing or light, light sourcing, um, the it does come down to a bandwidth thing. It, it can it could be beneficial. There might be people who are bottlenecked in ray tracing because of their bandwidth on their card, at which point VRAM tuning might make the greatest difference in your benchmark testing. But uh, for actual general everyday game playing, and it's the games that I find have been crashing out. Um, you can just leave your VRAM tuning off altogether, or you can um, just just very incremental. Uh, uh, again, uh, this, I can go to 2200 easily. Uh, 2150, I think, is what the RAM on my card is rated at. But by factory, my card runs at 2000 raw or vanilla. Uh, I encourage you to leave it at, at 2000 raw. I, I did find, certainly, in, I was using Passmark as my util for testing, and I found that 2060 gave me a much better Passmark score than 2040 or 2020. Um, but even at 2040, like just the, the, the smallest of bumps, if it's, it's a free boost that you can take after you've got all your other overclocking sorted out, take it. But you can tune it last. Right. Okay, while you're doing your testing, you probably just want to leave your fan tuning off. Just leave it at 100%. You probably don't want things like zero RPM on. Um, ultimately, once you've done all your benchmarking, once you've figured out what your top thermals are, once you've come in and looked at um, what temperature you're running at, therefore what percentage your fan would be running at. You can, you can cross-reference that and come backwards and have a look at that. If you know that you're sitting at 75 degrees Celsius and you know that on fan curve you're just above 25%, oh, wherever that would be, about 30-something percent, um, you can then actually dial that in. You can, you can actually create a profile where you say, at this fan speed, I want you running at this speed. And, uh, and over time, you'll learn your own fan, where it's quietest and where you want it to run. I'm a big fan of quiet computing, so I generally, I, I generally tweet for uh, optimal thermals, uh, optimal for headroom. The point of the, the point where you can run it the quickest without having to put a whole ton more power into it in order to achieve that. And as I said, I was running with my power limit at minus 10 or minus 15 nonstop. I don't think increasing that has yielded me. Oh, maybe one or two more frames, maybe in some low points. I'm really not. Look, I might be running beta video drivers. I don't know if this is as active. Uh, I feel like I need to give some feedback to, the, to AMD on this at the moment. It doesn't. Uh, there's times when I've run power tuning and it's absolutely done exactly what it says it's doing. Uh, and in all my testing last night, I, I didn't see it doing. It didn't really feel like it was doing what it should be doing, which maybe says I'm not really pushing anything very hard. Or I don't know. Anyway, my, my current. Uh, you don't need to look at my fan tuning. You may wish to come down here to power tuning. The, the people that seem to be very clever with their overclocking and really tweak things to the absolute max limits seem to come up with the best marriage of the voltage here and the power limit here, and they generally tweak for about 8 to 10%. Right? Where 15 gives it a little bit too much headroom and it, it can shoot up a little bit too quick or a little bit too uncontrollably, or maybe the window that it creates at a greater than 10% over a reasonable low point just opens up too much extra power to be available when the car doesn't really need it. But uh, coming back to what I was saying about voltage here, sorry, I'm sorry to be all over the place again, a couple of coffees. Uh, 1149 was the low. Uh, I found that 1151, it ran perfectly, took the least amount of power, and again, I could run it wherever on here, it's fine. But at 11.51, and this is specific to my card, your card will be, you know, will bin a little bit differently out of the factory. A little, it might run a couple of millivolt lower and be happy. It might a little bit more. 11.51 was just about perfect, but occasionally I'd get a flicker to the screen. Now, I was getting horrible flickers to the screen nonstop until I replaced a really good HDMI cable in there, but I'm running into a 10-bit panel. I'm using HDR. I'm using high resolution. I am technically pushing the bandwidth down by... HDMI cable. There was reason why swapping my HDMI cable to a better one did make a difference. Right? I saw a lot of occasional flickering or getting out of sync with the display all dropped off when I went to a better HDMI cable. But I did find when I had to set to 11.51, I would get the occasional flicker on the screen. So 11.52 was just about perfect. Um, and last night, right as I was going to bed, just sitting in that worst case scenario of 11.53 where I found the temperature got up way higher. Um, but the, the power available to the card was way higher, which should sustain higher 
megahertz and essentially allow them to have the, the power that they need to really achieve it. Should have allowed for the fastest possible numbers. But I found in my benchmark, I was actually getting better numbers at 11.52. Um, but I just, just for the case of a worst case scenario last night with my, my testing, I did leave it at a slightly higher number and, um, and have that running. So once you've got some numbers in here, and you might want to try it now, 11.55 and, and, and 20, 40, and um, you know you, you might wish to, again, I said 18.50 for The Witcher initially was where I chose a difference of 50 megahertz on here was the difference of about 10 degree on the junction, right? So when I had that set about 40 megahertz lower than I've currently got it set, basically under 20, about 2300, the junction temperature was so much lower, like not just a little bit lower, so much lower. Um, and what I found is when I was running Hogwarts, there was some low frame rate bits where I was sitting at 27 frames a second. I'm sitting there going, oh, if I could get 10% more speed through overclocking, I'd be really happy. And I did the math in my head and went, well, there's no way I'm going to get another 10%. But I thought, I'll just see what I can get. And when I bump that up another 50 megahertz, 40 in my case, whilst the temperature went a lot higher, it just got over whatever bottleneck it was in. And it, it didn't, it, it, it technically shouldn't have given me an extra frame, right? It should have taken 27 and made it maybe 28. And I went back in the game and it was sitting at 30. And it was the same lighting, the same screen, the same everything. And over hours and hours and hours, it was 30. And it's like, oh, wow. And then after a large amount of time in that one spot, my junction was hit 110. And lo and behold, exactly what I expected to have happen, my 30 frames a second dropped to 29. And then over a large amount of time, it dropped to 28. And that's essentially what happens when your junction hits 110. You're no longer getting these speeds. Right? What actually happens is internally the card will clock them down. And that's why it's, it's counterintuitive and it gets back to, trust me, I can make your card run quicker with slower numbers. Right? It gets back to, if we lock your card at 60 kilometres an hour and you don't have any traffic lights, you're going to get to the city quicker or your game's going to run quicker. And that's exactly what happened, is that getting it under control, even if it was looking at it, it was running at a lower speed, and this number looks like it was at a lower speed, in benchmark testing, I was getting much higher frame rates. In the game, I was getting stabilised, faster frame rates, especially on my frame rate lows, my 1% lows, which is the one that matters, the one that leads to frame time issues. So it might seem counterproductive to set a, lo a lower speed to get a faster output, but it is true. Now, what I'm going to do, I expect after an entire night of running, is that this machine will be just taking a holiday. Look, it's running actually really quite well. Look, normally I would drop the transparency on the bit down the bottom there. Uh, right, so let's just go good -dunk, good -dunk. And I think if, okay, that should be my fast button. I forget what's my up button, oh, there we go. Okay, so look, I did get a frame rate drop there briefly. Okay, so I actually stopped flying around last night when I dropped to 25 in this area. And I figured there must have been something going on. It might have been a time of day thing. Generally, I could fly around the map at 30 solid. It could be because I haven't been flying around the map. Uh, even though it does a pixel shader pass when the game first begins, it's... Okay, that island just to my left there is perfect. There's a, a low frame rate down here. I'm just going to show it right here. Um, there's a low frame rate down here of... Ah, ah, hang on, get out of fast mode, get out of fast mode. My bad, sorry, I'm, I'm not using my normal game pad that I use, I'm using an actual full-fledged keyboard. I don't know where my keys are. I think that's my walk button. Right, yep. So there is a frame rate spot just down here. It'll drop down to like 17, if you can get the tree in front of the screen. There we go, 14, if I put a Lumos up. No, I've got Lumos there. Oh, my apologies if I put that Lumos up. There we go, look at that. That's a really bad frame rate low. And anyone running just for any card can bomb their machine by coming to this spot. Right? Don't use this as a measurement spot. Going, if I tweak this one spot, my game will run flawlessly everywhere. Right? It just needs work. This <laughs> spot just needs work. Um, right? But outside of this one moment, right? If you can find a worse spot scenario in the game that's unreasonable, yeah, don't bother about tuning for that. I think you'll find the people who make the game will probably tune uh, that in time to run better. <laughs> so I think, uh, if you get away from the occasional broken spot, right, generally the game will run pretty well.
It, it really does. It's a beautiful game. Oh, I hit my second whiskey. Again, I don't usually play on the set. Hit my fingers right now. Um, so look, the idea is, is you just want to fly around. You want to run it at certain times a day. Worst case scenarios. Uh, what I was saying was that I, I found I was running at thirty. I was sitting at 27 frames a second to the point where it was worth putting in just that little bit more of an overclock and having my junction temp go that little bit higher if I could smooth out what was what we might call the 1% lows. Uh, now, it's fair to say I'm tuning, I've tuned, I'm running at stupidly high resolution for the settings I'm running at. And I should really be running at 1440, at which point the machine is just stable at 30. I, I basically don't see it drop. I mean, I can go to that island and I can see it drop. There are certain load spots where I do see it basically hit that 25 for a split second. Uh, I mean, I personally think they were connected to a drive I was running. Uh, I was running a, an ancient, really budget SSD, the sort of budget SSD I wouldn't put in anyone's machine uh, as being a Samsung Evo. And the Evos, the benchmark was the same as the, the Samsung Pros in a lot of tests. But those tests are generally done at a desktop productivity level where your CPU is not flat out. And so your CPU has the availability to compress and decompress the data that's going to those drives. Um, but the problem is, is that when you're in a game, and if your CPU is fully needed by that game, your CPU doesn't have any overhead left to do the compression or decompression that the, the cheaper. In the case of Samsung, they call them Evo, but every, every drive manufacturer has what's a budget drive and a pro drive. And if you're running the budget drive, it doesn't have a dedicated CPU built into it to handle all the compression decompression. And so it, it relies on your CPU overhead. And quite often in gaming, right, the budget drives can let a machine down that's right on the CPU limits in ways that the pro drives don't. So some people say, oh, no other, you know, my, my machine doesn't have a problem with any other game. And then they come to this game and then they have problems or they come to Kingdom Come Deliverance or some game that streams textures in and they have problems. And so for me, I was running at um, 14... Oh, well, irrelevant of what resolution I'm running at. When, when I'm running on this ancient Evo drive, and I did it on purpose, I wanted to see if, what the PC could do, um, I have found I get these little frame rate hiccups in zone transitions that I don't get when I'm running on my NVMe or a faster drive. Um, so the fact that I'm running on a really early generation Samsung Evo with a really poor throughput and still having a game like this, which is texturing in, streaming in the textures. Yeah, okay, in part, having 16 gig of VRAM probably ameliorates that in that once the game is loaded in, I sit at about 15 and a half gig of VRAM. Um, it's quite happy. Now I'll show you another bomb spot. Right, if you want to have your machine drop down to 20 frames a second, this one here. If you're looking that way, you should get 25, 27 maybe. Oh, it just depends what you tune for. But if you look over this way, oh, you should be able to get it to bomb right down. Okay, so that shows me that my, my overclocks are worthwhile in that I have smoothed out some of my worst frame rate lows. Oh, there we go, down to 16. Um, but I mean, the, the fog at this time of day probably aids it as a worst case scenario. When I can start a reasonable load, which consistently across the game you will find, um, is this one here. We can look back at the courtyard. And this is a really good spot to tweak for because it, a lot of the low points in your game that you consistently will come across will have about the same amount of loading as this screen here, where you've got the complexity of the foliage, you've got the complexity of the light, um, you've got an incredible amount of geometric detail in the distance because Hogsmeade is just behind everything there. Um, this is a good testing spot because you, you do load your machine pretty well. And if you chuck a Lumos on, oh, you should be able to get it to 99%, pretty much 100%. And I mean, look, I'd like to do a joke video here. If you look at my GPU power without Lumos and look at my GPU power with Lumos, you can see that my light spell is consuming at least five watts. I'd like to do a little funny video and just talk about um, how much brightness you can actually get from a five watt globe versus a five watt wand. <laughs> what? Is, is there a reason magic has regressed in the world because it's impractical to use it versus since Tesla and people came along and gave us electricity? Maybe, maybe. But uh, what I was saying before is that I'm, I'm running at a ridiculous resolution. Um, I, I could run the next resolution down and get much more stable frame rates. I don't mind my frame rate occasionally janking down below 
what it does uh, because I know the level of fidelity I'm getting in the graphics and it just looks amazing. I did find at the next resolution down that there was a, an aliasing on the screen I could see at my sitting spot um, that I just didn't need. It was a little fuzzy. It took away some of the visual fidelity, uh, mostly just in grass uh, in, in the middle distance. It was not the only time I could find that that, that resolution was letting me down. Um, but I, I find even at this crazy resolution, uh, north of about 1600 res, that's my low resolution, um, being able to run the game at this point where a lot of the places in the game, my low frame rate was sitting at 33, even on lower settings. If I know that I'm 30 is basically going to be my low frame rate, I don't mind tuning for it. So I, I have essentially tuned the game so that it runs fairly flawlessly at 30. And you go, well, why would you tune for 30? Look, I've covered that in my last video. Um, 30 with no added latency, right? So the FSR2, the DLSS later modes, they add, or frame generation certainly, add frame latency. And I found at 60 frames a second, which is what FSR2 might, might be pushing for to allow me to have, if I'd pushed for 60, the latency on the controller, it actually took longer for the game to respond to my inputs than it did at 30 frames a second without that added latency. So because there's not a single frame, well, there is one frame because my, my TV is 22 millisecond delay, my mouse is 12 millisecond delay, um, 33 milliseconds, there would be a one frame delay possibly, I would expect, between what I touch and what happens. Um, for me, that is that's as close as feeling like there is no latency. Um, if I was on a wireless controller at 30 frames a second, I couldn't handle that. The, the, the latency there would be a little bit too much for me. I'd probably want it at a faster frame rate. But uh, when I'm on the keyboard and mouse, tuned for 30, um, I, I wouldn't be able to necessarily tell the difference between 60 and 30. I know that sounds like a big ask, but 60 using FSR2 certainly was less responsive than 30 using either FSR1 or no, no enhancement mode. So. The little run around town I'm doing right now is designed to be a worst case scenario. The reason I run towards scare, square and then run is somewhere around about this rock, it caches the next zone. I think it starts clearing out the zone behind it. It's one of those little zones where you get a low frame rate. I must admit, I've never really seen a 30 there. Um, normally, I've tuned it so it doesn't only go below 25. Uh, I might need to recheck my settings. It might just be that was a one off. It could be to do with the, the extra mist or fog at this moment in time. But uh, look, it does seem a little bit overburdened. I mean, in fairness, the machine has been running this game now for a good solid oh, many, 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 many hours. Uh, look, look, it seems consistent. If it was a one-off, I mean, we never know. Sometimes the de novo copy protection just does its random check in the background until you get the one-off frame hitch or glitch. Uh, the first time it generates a given pixel shader effect, even though it has a pre-caching of shaders, it still generates some of the shaders once your game is running. Um, and so that's there, there are moments where you'll see a, a frame hitch for the first time it generates that particular shader effect. Um, so, look, on the whole, this is pretty stable. So, look, what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to close out of this game. Uh, okay, I'll leave it running. We'll see if I can crash things. Right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just drop back to desktop. So, I use some utility software called Performance Test. Pass mark. And again, you can register this, highly recommended. I think you get 30 days of it for free. Uh, if you're not on the internet, you can keep using it beyond 30 days. Uh, it'll just tell you it's out of date. But I come into 3D testing. There's two tests here that are, that are relevant to Hogs Wallet, Hog, Hog Wallet's legacy. The DirectX 12, because it's running in DirectX 12 mode, and GPU Compute, because it's using the parts of the shader die that I think is relevant um, to complex lighting or a lot of what the game is using. So I couldn't run the GPU compute test before I tuned my video card. If I ran factory defaults, GPU compute was crashing my machine. I was booked for a five week turnaround on my video card, potentially being sent a different video card. Didn't want that. Decided to take matters in my own hand, tuned my machine, and all of a sudden I could run this test. I uh, usually get to there and the machine would just turn off. Okay, now I can see it's having a hard time putting the overlay in the bottom of the screen. It flicked up for a brief moment. It is handy to see the overlay. 
I'm doing this test, I get the feeling that the machine is switching between Hogwarts and this quite quickly. So if you're running the test and you want to see the overlay, you can actually just bring up the metrics in the background and run the test on top of that. And that way you can keep an eye on your junction. So the set of values I've tuned for right now will hit 110 on the junction in bits of this test. As I said, when the junction hits 110, your card internally clocks itself down. The problem I was having initially, and the problem you might have been having, was that when the junction shoots up 30 degree intent instantly, in less than a second, if it was to go above 115, right, that's machine shutdown time. So the values I've put in place have limited it so that when it jumps up, it doesn't jump up quite so extremely. Where it jumps up is still in a window where it can get control of the card. It then down clocks itself and then it can handle things. And so there was quite a few times last night when, when running through this as a test, it was about to generate a number for us to tell us how quick it can do this test. I would keep running through this test. And I would change numbers until, oh, no, okay, it crashed. Okay, I've had a lock. So when running the game in the background, that was a little bit too much. And that's a hard lock, right? If you hit your caps lock key and it will not light up, you've lost at, at a BIOS level, basically at a really basic hardware level, you've lost access to your machine. If, if your caps lock key won't come on and off, right, you're not going to get control of your machine again. It's time to go hit the restart button. Um, okay, so look, that there is where I'm going to wind this video up right now, just because I, I can't practically show anything more on the screen. Um, but yeah, you, you come in, you run your benchmark testing software, in this case Passmark, it then generates you a number. Uh, you then might come in and, and change your clock speed or your power uh, that you're feeding the card, and then you might keep looking at that number. And whatever that number is getting faster and faster and faster without hitting 110 on your junction, right? You're kind of finding out what the max my card can do. That's excellent. Once you find out what the max your card can do, you save that. You might save that as a profile. Uh, and then you go and you run those games you couldn't previously run. Right now, look, obviously I'm going to have to do a second video. It'll probably be a really short one. Well, I didn't realize it's gone an hour and 20 minutes. I don't expect anyone to have watched the video until here. If you have, I promise you my next video will not be 25 minutes long, right? And, and, if, and actually what I'll do is I'll do a 15 minute, here's a quick how to tune type video. I don't imagine anyone's going to watch this. I do say thank you for uh, persevering with me up till here. I hope I have explained things for you in meaningful ways. Um, but I, I do understand this has been a very long video with some very boring stuff on the screen. Uh, hopefully my, my voice has been fun enough in tone or clear enough in volume to have made this uh, at least listenable. Anyway, again, I say thank you. Thank you for engaging with me. Thank you for your time given. I will wish you well in uh, circumventing your problem, running your AMD graphics card. Uh, it can be done. You can make it run. Uh, after you've got it working, you might find that if you couldn't run any lag before because it was making it run too hot, you might now be able to lock in that any lag. And uh, I can say, oh, I'm running with any lag on, even locked down at 30 frames a second in the games that uh, you want the visual fidelity in. So that for me is the Witcher. Uh, role-playing games generally. You know, in Fortnite, I definitely want the 60 frames a second plus. Uh, it's a competitive shooter. If you get an extra 15 milliseconds uh, of heads up in terms of the location of where another player is, that's going to help you be able to track them on your screen and shoot them, right? There's a reason why competitive games, we need high frame rates. But uh, if a game like The Witcher, where when you're in combat, if you click a button to attack, and then there's an animation system in place, it takes a while for that attack to play out, Right? You don't need 60 frames a second. If you've got 30 frames a second with perfect frame pacing, such that you can't tell the difference between 30 and 60 frames a second because of the latency and everything being perfect, um, right? 30 frames a second isn't, isn't a bug there. It's not a bad thing. Um, so first, that's one of the first things we need to do is educate ourselves that 30 can be very playable. But 30 with frame rate generation on, whoa, that's pretty painful. I agree. 30 without your anti lag on, yeah, it might not be as, as, as zippy. To the frame as you can possibly achieve. So um, look, it is worth playing and, and tuning and tweaking and finding out what works for you. Don't just go off what the internet says. You know, random people on the internet who believe that you, you tune games that have to be at 60 frames a second in, in 4K resolution, right? In the 90s when we got a cutting edge game, I think when the, oh, Deus Ex came out, I had a Matrox card at the time and it was great. You could tune the ultra settings in that game. I was getting one frame every 30 seconds. Just getting into the menu again to turn the settings down took, took about 10 minutes. <laughs> so <laughs> one frame every 30 seconds, but that's because I cranked it to full resolution at, at full settings. And so generally what you do is you turn your resolution up when you've got 
power to bear or frame rate, you know, get overhead to bear. You turn your anti-aliasing up. Oh, oh, I haven't lost total control. Um, you, you, you turn those settings up when, uh, I might just do it the easy way, signing out will hopefully get me back control. Um, yeah, yeah you, you turn those settings up when you've got headroom to bear. Uh, I like the, the visual fidelity. I like to turn all my graphical settings up. Um, so, you know, if you want to see everything in ultra, like I was just running uh, at a high resolution, it can be done. Anyway, I'm going to say ciao for now. You be well. Well wishes with you.